<laughs> Hello, BookTube. Thanks to that well-known BookTube troublemaker, David Wiley, I have been talking lately about Bookshelf Essentials, an idea for an ongoing video series that he came up with where you pick out the books on your shelves that really don't need to worry about getting culled, <laughs> the ones that are essential to you. Uh, I've been doing that. I've been having a blast doing that, so I'm going to keep doing it. And uh, I have a bookshelf essential for today that is prompted not only by one part of BookTube, David Wiley making a bookshelf essentials a thing, but also another part of BookTube, Micah Cummins and Anne Novella do a regular thing called Classics and Company, an informal thing that has, a, I guess, a lively discord, where they pick a classic and read it for a while. Concentrate on it for a while. It's kind of a quasi-public buddy read with a large group of people. And uh, I have asked to be a part of Classics and Company many, many times, and they've both shouted no because they hate me because I smell. But I observe from the sidelines. I, uh, I love watching and cheering from the sidelines. And the book that they are doing right now for Classics and Company is also a bookshelf essential of mine. This is Moby Dick by Herman Melville. This is the old Penguin classic, one of many, many editions of Moby Dick that I have. And as all of you will know, this is Herman Melville's novel about the whaling ship, the Pequod, which sets off from New England for the whaling beds on the other side of the world in order to hunt whales for their oil. And that's what everybody on the Pequod thinks when they set sail. What they don't know is that their captain... Ahab is on a mission of vengeance. Sure, he wants to fill his holds. Sure, he wants to bring back his subscribers' investment for his vessel. But he doesn't care if none of that happens. He wants to make his revenge on Moby Dick, the white whale that dismasted him, the white whale that bit off one of his legs. This has driven Ahab insane. It's pretty clear that he is that he is far beyond the simply being a hard ass in terms of a naval commander. He's far beyond that. He's nuts. In a very Old Testament prophet kind of way, there's nothing pathetic about Ahab's madness. Instead, it is commanding, mesmerizing. He has a large part of the Pequod's crew under his spell from time to time, even the men who know as his first mate does, that he is leading them almost certainly through their destruction. Something there is in his nature, something there is in his approach to Moby Dick, feels like an affront to nature. It feels like an affront to God. When one of those mates confronts Ahab, he reveals the full extent of his blasphemy. I'd strike the sun if it offended me. That is doom. That is, that is doom. Unless they're lucky enough to actually take Moby Dick, which no whaling vessel has ever done. Uh, that The full extent of that is revealed as the novel goes on. And Ahab nails a gold doubloon to the mast and says, You get that if you, take, if you help me capture, kill Moby Dick. So the crew is largely on board. They're not helpless. They're, they're largely on board. And that is largely the story that Moby Dick becomes. I don't think it started out that way. Herman Melville had written many books before this, and they were hits. He had taken his own naval experiences in the South Seas or whatnot and transformed them into rollicking adventure story type novels. If you read those novels, Omu and Typey and Marty and whatnot, you can sense, I think, under the surface, something that isn't just an ordinary blood and swash type writer. Although that was the market, and although that could guarantee you a good career, I think you can sense in those books that there is something brooding under the surface, but it is resolutely under the surface, whatever it is. Of course, the thing we're talking about here is the dark genius of the author. Is the author willing to box up his genius, the voices clamoring in his head, and write for the market? And Melville was able to do that. He was willing and able to do that for a while. The one thing that he hadn't, one aspect of his own real experience that he had not really tapped into was that he had actually done time on a whaler called the Akushnet. So he knew what it was like. They were squalid vessels. They were ugly vessels. They were harsh vessels. They were engaged in a horrible, horrible activity. 
I'm not talking here just about the lack of cleanliness or seamanship like you get wonderfully lampooned in Patrick O'Brien. The American whalers in two Patrick O'Brien novels are pricelessly brochetted. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the horror of going out hunting for whales who had a, an older culture than any human that stuck harpoons in them, had a more complex language, more loving family bonds, um, more lively intellect, more lively personalities, more textured personalities, were in, in every way more awe-inspiring mammals. They just didn't have hands, so they couldn't make harpoons. And they also didn't have the human genetic defect of wanting to kill every example of something instead of only the one thing you need to live. A sperm whale, sperm whales will hunt squid down in the darkness long, long below the furthest reaches of the sun. They will hunt giant squid. But the thought has never crossed any sperm whale's mind to kill every giant squid. Uh, and humans think that way by, by default. They are that way, as the saying goes, out of the box. That's what whalers were set to do. That's what their job was, to go out and kill these people and render their fat and flesh for oil to light lamps in libraries and houses. Uh, it was, could be very lucrative, but boy, oh boy, did you pay for it. You fit out a whaler. We get the fitting out of the Pequot at the beginning of this book. You fit out a whaler. You give everyone on board a lay. So you give them uh, whatever fraction of the, the, the payoff when the ship comes back into harbor with all of its holes fully laden. You give them that. Of course, the shareholders are going to get the major lays. The captain will get a major payout. The, the mates will. But everyone gets a proceed. Everyone gets a part of the the voyage, provided you're lucky enough to come back in one piece. Sperm whales especially, but also all kinds of other whales, who are as big as buildings, they didn't like being hunted, and they the ability to destroy a whaling, a wooden, wind-driven whaling vessel, they had the ability to destroy it easily if they wanted to. Uh, plenty of whaling vessels were lost at sea, plenty of them were lost to whales, plenty of them were lost to storms. So you outfit a whaling vessel like this, and you bring all your stores on board, and you say goodbye to Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard or whatever, you might not come back. And if you do come back, it might be years later. Three, four years later. If you do, probably you're set for life. But it's a long, long process. Melville was part of that process. He went, he under, He learned what that was like on the Akushnet, learned everything about the technology, the terminology, and that's, in a way, unfortunate for people who come to Moby Dick, because he dumps all of that at the beginning of this book. He dumps a ton of actual cetology, studies of whales, and a ton of the technicalities of whaling in this book, at the beginning and all through the book. I myself understand his urge to do that, and I understand why he wanted to do that. Uh... I have I have long cherished a theory, I believe it's true, that he was making this book into a triworks. He was making this book itself into a whaling vessel. The key thing about a whaling vessel is they weren't a ship of the line. They weren't a merchantman who had ports to go to. They were after an animal that lives in the ocean. So they had to be completely self-sufficient for sometimes all of those three years. They might put in somewhere here or there. But they were carrying something very valuable and they didn't have a complement of marines to protect it. So oftentimes, whaling vessels were a world unto themselves. You had a triworks on board where you would render the corpse of the person that you killed into the oils that you need. You had stores on board, water on board, everything on board as a self-contained unit. Melville saw that firsthand, and I believe he was trying in his own way to make this book into that by giving you everything that you would ever need in the book so you don't need to go elsewhere. He does not assume in this book that you know any whaling lore or any whaling terminology. He doesn't assume in this book that you know anything about whales. Instead, he tells it to you all. He tells you all of that. Now, in a way, as is so many, as is so often the case with this author, he was proven right. Because although there are countries that whale, that do commercial, we want to call it commercial whaling today, they do it for bloodlust. It's not a, it's not a worldwide industry anymore. It It's not much of a victory. Whales die a lot in the catastrophic line fishing that is being done in the ocean everywhere. But uh, the industry in the way that Melville describes it in this book did disappear. So he was right to make this a triworks of a book. But 
he was wrong in terms of understanding the reader. That is a trial, a burden for the reader. How many readers of this book have been put off because they open it expecting that it will start with Call Me Ishmael, and instead they're getting encyclopedia entries. Lots of them <laughs> about whales and whale parts and whaling terminology and whatnot. Um, probably a lot of them. Probably over the, over the course of the years, probably a lot of readers have been put off by that. I myself, when I've taught this book or when I've urged it on friends, I have gladly said, I will let me buy you a, a mass market paperback of this book. I don't think Moby Dick is made in a mass market paperback anymore. It's trade paperbacks or higher. I would tell them, let me, I'll go to Wordsworth and I'll get you a paperback of the book. And I'll put a, in the table of contents, I'll put a little pencil check mark next to the chapters of the book that you can skip. I had so many people over the decades say, what? You're advising me to skip chapters in a book that you never stop praising, that you love so much, that you're always talking about? I am. I am. I'm not a purist at all. I'm not a dude bro. I want you to love this book, and you're not going to love it if you don't read it, <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't get anywhere near the driving mad plot, the pumping hot blood of the plot, if you don't get anywhere near that because of Melville, well, then you'll never fall in love with it. So, so I have done that many, many times. I'll gladly do it for you. I, it's, it's a trial to do, to read this in the way that Melville wrote it. And I think that's indicative of a lot that was changing in Melville. He had written all of those adventure stories. And he had an idea for another book. And he, he needed money. His whole life he needed money. But he had an idea for another book, this book. Something, the bare bones of this book, something about the Akushnet, something about a happy-go-lucky, adventurous book of whaling. A novel set in the whaling world. That book would have sold. It would have, had, it would have continued a string of successes on his part. But he didn't write that book. He couldn't write that book. Something... That, under, that underlying tone in all of his earlier fiction was too strong for him to ignore anymore. He himself said that every few years I'm a different person, and that he didn't count himself as even beginning to be a person until he was in his 20s. And that process was ongoing for his whole life. So in, in the early 1850s, he did what in the early 1850s so many of us did. He went to his father-in-law and asked for money. <laughs> his his father-in-law, Judge Shaw, was wealthy and a curmudgeon, but generous. He would read you the riot act at a, a, a steak shop down by the by the docks. He would read you the riot act about your improvidence and how you can't you can't keep two pennies in your pocket. But you would end up with the money, and he wouldn't expect it back. Lemshaw deserves a book of his own. He deserves a novel of his own. But Mel, he was Melville's father-in-law, so of course the answer was going to be yes. Melville thought, I need to get away. Now, I think that what he was trying to get away from was that growing voice inside him, which, of course, you can't escape. Uh, but he thought that it was geographic. So, hi, baby. How are you doing? Do you want to come down here? Give them some Frida yoga? Oh, we haven't had Frida yoga in a while, have we? Oh, <laughs> Well, you're going to hold that position forever, baby? Oh, right to your toe tips. Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, where was I? Oh, right, Lemshaw. Uh, it was with father-in-law skepticism, but nevertheless, the money was sound, that Lemuel Shaw lent uh, Melville the money to buy a farm and property in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, out in the Berkshires, which uh, I, some of you have come to visit me here, but none of us have ever gone to Tanglewood. Um, so, somewhere, sooner or later, one of you needs to come out. Maybe David Murphy can go out in the summer, or Mike Cummins can come up in the summer, and we can go to Tanglewood. It's like nothing you'll ever experience. It's worth it to do. Uh, that Tanglewood is the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and it is in the Berkshires as well. And that is where Herman Melville went to be a so-called gentleman farmer. So he wouldn't necessarily be 
yoking the oxen himself, but he would he would run the place and he would work and buck in as he could, and there would be time and peace to write. And there was definitely that. His his views were incredible, as you can scarcely help but avoid in the Berkshires. There was peace. Not the inner peace that he needed. Writers always do this. They always think if I just buy external peace. If I, buy a nice, uh, if I go to a nice quiet place, then I will be quiet. And it's, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> but uh, he did. He went there. And in 1851, he wrote The Whale. He wrote Moby Dick. He brought it out into the world. In exactly the way that I'm describing. In ex as exactly the kind of book that I'm describing. Only there wasn't anybody at bookstores in 1851 to gently mark with a pencil the chapters that you could skip. Instead, readers got this. Well, they got this thing. Because Melville, as he wrote, he, he, he confided in his wife. He wrote, he tried to write to his father-in-law, who was the last man in the world to understand such things. And he also tried to write to, her, to Nathaniel Hawthorne, tried to say, I don't know what this is. But I, I had to write it. It, it. It's not the book that I originally intended, but I had to write it this way. And... It's big and weird and wild and beautiful and strange and off-putting as often as it is inviting. It isn't anything like Melville had ever written, and the public didn't want it. <laughs> as simple as that. He had cultivated a reading public, and it didn't want this. I would argue that nowhere in the world was there a reading public that wanted this book the way it was. I think that you had to wait almost a century to get that reading public. He didn't get that reading public. He didn't have it. And so it was, people were baffled by it. There were a couple of critics, including one in Boston, who thought, who did accurately see and say, something strange is here. And one critic, or a couple of critics in the UK said that as well. He said, this is almost certainly a great novel. Now, it has since gone on, colloquially, in American pop culture and American public culture, to be called the great American novel, which would have flabbergasted Melville just flabbergasted him. Uh, it would have, flattened, would have flattened anybody that he knew. And yet, it's often called that. I think, I myself have often said that you can't say great American novel. You have to at least constrict by century. This is certainly the great American 19th century novel. No question about it. No other competitors, not even from Hawthorne uh, or Twain. Or, or anybody else. Now, if you're doing the 19th century, there's nothing that comes close to this, whatever it is. Uh, but its lukewarm reception by critics and by the public, you would think, might prompt an author to, okay, well, I tried a different thing, a different register, a different scope, a different kind of thing. It didn't work. I know what does work, and I need something to work. I can't just sponge off my father-in-law for the rest of my life. So I'll go back to writing the things that did, the South Sea Adventures, the, the, that sort of thing. Melville couldn't do that. He couldn't do that. So he wrote uh, one bo another book and then another book and the public just rejected them, completely rejected them, to the point where he had to leave writing novels completely and just get work as a talk inspector for decades. Just, just out in all weathers, solid paycheck, good, what we would now call good benefits. Writing, I think, the whole time. Not only fiction, but poetry. Weird stuff. But I, that stuff had to be mostly privately printed. No one knew anything about it. Certainly the reading public didn't know anything about it. And that was it. As uh, I don't know that... Who's the editor of this? Harold Beaver. I'm not sure that Harold Beaver uh, makes this point in this Penguin edition. And I don't think it's in the Martin Library. But in some... it's often, It often comes up in Melville biographies and also in Melville introductions to his work. That when he died, nobody remembered that he had been an author. It had been... It had been a long time, 50 years, so no one, no one remembered that he had been an author. It wasn't the great novelist Herman Melville is dead. Mm -hmm. it's, that is kind of weird. And it was, a, it was a succession, I hate to give them credit, but when they, when they earn it, they get it from me. It was a succession of academics that largely went back to this book and said, this is brilliant. This is absolutely incredible. This is not an oddity. This was not a failure on its author's part. This is a major American novel. They were entirely right, and this is the choice for Classics and Company. Uh, for, I think, 
the, the next few weeks is Moby Dick. A strong encouragement for you to read this book. I strongly encourage you to read this book. It will harrow you up once you accommodate to it. <laughs> it won't do otherwise. But it will harrow you up once you do, unless you read an edited version, unless you skip the chapters that you can skip. They, you'll be skipping great Melville prose, but there are chapters in here, plenty of them, that you can just let go to, to concentrate on the story of Ahab and Moby Dick. Uh, which will work. That will absolutely work on you. And there are, subs there are subsidiary stories there about Ishmael, the narrator of the book, and about Queequeg and the other harpooners. Once you get to that story, that's the story. It, that story has no place in an earlier South Seas adventure novel. That's something else again. Uh, and that is worth reading. This is incredibly worth reading. <laughs> very, very much so. I would argue, I, ordinarily when I did that schema where I checked off chapters for people, let them know what they shouldn't read, ordinarily those are people who weren't really dyed-in-the-wool readers, whereas the people listening to me now are dyed-in-the-wool readers. For you all, I would say just, uh, just pull up your stockings and read the whole thing. Trust that Melville knows what he's doing. He does. Trust that you will end up in awe of this book. You will. Just trust that, even at the points, the many, many points, the many, many chapters where it doesn't look that way. For for diehard readers who are okay with books not being easy, for them, I would say, just bear with it. Just do, this is everything that it has been billed to be by the American literary tradition. So a little suffering might be in order, especially since it's another world. It's a strange other world that Melville is giving you entire. He's not saying, I know of this other world and I'm going to draw experiences from it. He's giving you that whole world. I think he's doing it in beautiful prose. The best prose he ever wrote, before or since. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a lot of details here. I think if you can suspend that kind of, I need my satisfaction right now, and I need it on every page, I think if you can suspend that for a thousand page book by Brandon, Brandon Sanderson, you can probably just do it for Moby Dick. And you should. What a book this is. Oh, my. So I will leave links to uh, Classics and Company, and, and you go over there, try out their Discord, see what you, what you get for discussions. But the main thing is that the book for Classics and Company this time around is Moby Dick, and you should definitely read it. I have a feeling that for some of you, it has been a white whale for decades on your shelf, but no, now's not the time. Uh, I don't know. Now's not the time. Or maybe... Uh, you know, 1987 was the time and you pulled it down and you, uh, what is this? I don't know what this is. I can't take page after page of this. I have to get up in the morning or something like that. Probably some of you are in that position. Time to change that position. Give it a read. Tackle Moby Dick and succeed. Oh my, you'll be so happy that you did. <laughs> but anyway, I've gone on long enough, so I'm going to wrap this up. That is my bookshelf essential for today. Big surprise. It's Moby Dick. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now. Oh, but I'll be back. Thank you, too.